Jim, I've started the uh, Facebook. So if you want to put the slide up whenever you want. Okay. Even though it says it's not working, which is kind of normal for me. I have a note that says it's streaming on Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know why, but every time I start it on my computer here at work at home, it says it's not working, but it is. All right.
I'm about I'm about to start the recording. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association. Um, first Friday of the month meeting for March. We're glad to have guests with us on Facebook and our members attending um, via Zoom. Um, we're happy to have all of you tonight. Um, we do ask that people stay muted and that when you would like to communicate questions about the presentation, just enter it in, um, in the chat if you're on Zoom or type it in your uh, phone or whatever if you're on Facebook. We will keep track of those questions and we will make an effort to answer all of your questions. Um, I am May Smith. I'm the Tucson Amateur Astronomy Association president and we have working with us tonight Jim Knoll and Terry Lappin who are handling the technology and the Facebook and um, will you know help to meet your needs if you have any questions or, or any anything that uh, you you need to know during the meeting, you can communicate that via chat and um, and they will help you out if there's a problem or an issue you need to resolve. So um, we will go ahead and start. Um, and tonight we have a very distinguished person with us who served in lots of wonderful um, positions in astronomy, and he currently is serving on both uh, the faculty at the University of Arizona and at Texas A&M University. And so Dr. Rob Kinnicutt is going to talk to us tonight about pathways to discovery in astronomy and astrophysics in the 2020s. So um, Rob, are you ready to share your screen? Yep. Let's Wonderful. give it a go. See if that works. Okay. Uh, good. Does, does it look good? Looks good to me. Great. So first, let me apologize. I This is the first uh, Zoom I've done at night from my office in Texas. And the as rather unflattering of fluorescent lights that I've dimmed, but uh, I don't have a halo emanating from my head. Don't worry, it's just my bald head reflecting the light. Uh, no, it's a real honor uh, to speak to you. I think days gone by. I was at Arizona on the faculty between uh, 1988 and 2005, and then I spent 12 years in England before uh, trying to retire, and now I'm unretired in Arizona and Texas. Uh, but I, I've spoken a couple times before, but way back. Uh, uh, and so it, it's great to be back with you. Um, I'm going to talk about the Decadal Survey, which I chaired with uh, Fiona Harrison. Um, this, uh, this report came out at the beginning of November uh, the, and we made a national, we gave a Zoom, you know, of course, because of COVID, a uh, nationwide talk like this that ran for 75 minutes. And I know that's way too much for you and way probably above your pay grade and level. So I'm really only going to touch on highlights. Uh, we have an absolute uh, stop time of quarter after the hour, and I'll try to beat that by a bit. So we have plenty of time for questions. And so the way I'm going to do it is, uh, obviously only uh, hit on some points. I'm going to begin and spend quite a bit of time talking about what a decadal survey is, in case, you know, this is the first one you've heard about, uh, why they're so important, how they work, and then I'll get into talking about uh, the plan. This is essentially a 10-year plan for astronomy for the United States, uh, everything essentially, and uh, we'll talk about the content of most of, of some of those recommendations. And at the very end, since we've had now, let's see, one, two, three uh, 
months since, uh, I guess maybe four months since the rollout, uh, uh, tell you a little bit about the reception the report has received from Congress and from the astronomical community and, and by the federal agencies as well. So a little bit of everything. So let me uh, go on to the next slide. So let's just begin by talking about what these surveys are. Uh, decadal surveys, uh, as the name implies, they're surveys undertaken every 10 years in a given field, um, commissioned by the Congress of the US uh, and assigned to the National Academy of Sciences, right? A group of eminent scientists uh, first established by Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War. Their purpose is to give the government advice on uh, policy in the, in the sciences course. Um, and so the first uh, has two functions. Uh, we convene a group of experts first to try to uh, make an assessment of where the subject of the field stands, what were the successes of the last decade, and set scientific priorities. What are the important questions to be answered over the next decade? And then in part two, to recommend a prioritized a program of federal investments, you know, space missions, uh, new telescopes, uh, new funding programs, et cetera, uh, et cetera uh, which will allow us to, to actually answer what all those questions are. So it's a pretty big task. We're talking about, you know, upwards of $10 billion of spend that we're trying to plan over a decade. And uh, this is now a requirement. It's it, it initially, they were initiated by astronomers in 1964, um, but now are actually required every 10 years as part of the NASA Appropriation Act. Uh, here's a sort of a yellowing copy of the very first of these. This, ours was the seventh of these uh, decadal surveys, and they've changed a lot over that time. Uh, the, this first one, only prioritized astronomy on the ground. Um, and uh, the uh, list of names you see on the upper right, there are eight, the committee was eight people, all fairly uh, white men, most of them of advanced age. That, that other committee you see, I guess you can see my cursor here, all these names, that's another committee, ignore them. This was the whole survey. Um, and if they uh, needed some information, uh, they called up their friends, you know. Uh, so it was a very sort of smoke-filled room kind of process, uh, led, you could say, by the elite. Uh, but they actually did a very good job. They, the recommendations turned out turned out to be a very effective report. Um, and so, it, you know, as a measure of the importance of these reports, uh, for the uh, six, uh, well, let's not count ours, the six decadal surveys before ours, almost any major U.S. facility you can think of, whether it be the you know the CTAO four meter telescope, uh, the uh, you see them these ground based telescopes, Hubble Space Telescope, James Webb, every one of these uh, happened as the result of an assessment and a recommendation by a decadal survey. This is the process by which our community uh, blesses. Uh, project concepts and recommends them to government. Uh, so you get some idea, this is a pretty big deal, in other words. Um, anyway, going back, so this was 1964. Let's fast forward now to 2021, how things have changed. So here we have a much, much better cover now than they did in uh, 1964. Uh, and here's the first of three pages of committees of people who were involved. I don't expect you to go down this list of names, but this was the main survey committee, 20 people. I'd be remiss if I didn't call, uh, give a shout out to Fiona Harrison. She was co-chair of the survey along with me, uh, but truth be told, she was the heart and soul uh, of the survey. Just absolute uh, wonderful effort, all of these people. And then I'm just gonna scroll through. You just see a list of Pat, we had, uh, 13 panels, I think, uh, report to us uh, and advise us. All told, 131 astronomers uh, served on these panels, not eight, and very diverse. About 30% women, more than the fraction of women in the in the society, you know, in astronomy uh, right now. Uh, 
range of ages, sub, every subfield represented, good demographic, diversity, geographic, uh, you name it. Uh, as for uh, Arizona, uh, of course, I was co-chair of the whole survey. Uh, Marsha Ricci, who you know from Webb, uh, was chair of one, one of the most important panels, uh, uh, space observations panel. And if you go through the list, there are about a half a dozen Tucson astronomers in all uh, involved, uh, some at Stewart and some at LPL, and uh, they all did a terrific job. Um, and that those 131 people who were responsible essentially for gathering the recommendations together that went into the final report or only the tip of an iceberg, uh, the days of calling your buddies when you need information and getting this biased information are long over. The foundational materials we worked with were white papers and project proposals prepared by members of our community. Nearly 900 white papers, either on science or projects or the state of our profession, uh, over 6,000 astronomers were authors on at least one of these papers, and there are only 8,000 astronomers in the American Astron you know, professional astronomers in the AAS. So, you know, essentially almost everybody got involved. So it really is a truly community-based exercise, and one of the reasons it has uh, such clout uh, on the Hill and with the White House and so on. So uh, to finish up the sort of wrap up the introduction here, um, so sort of 60 years after the first of these, so the astronomy survey in 64 was the first decadal survey of any kind that the academy carried out. Uh, these uh, have huge impact. Uh, they've been so successful in astronomy now, they're carried out uh, in subfields of astronomy, such as you see here, planetary science, solar science, and in most other fields. Physics does these, chemistry, mathematics, everybody now, uh, does these. And the reason is they have impact. Congress uh, and the White House, uh, OMB and so on, respect these surveys because we make very difficult choices. Um, you know, even though we're recommending upwards of somewhere in the range of 10 to $20 billion of federal investment in astronomy over the next decade, the total you know, the total cost of what was proposed to us, all the ideas in those white papers we got, we never added up the number. We couldn't, you know, we didn't have the resource to cost every idea we received fully, but it was, you know, five to 10 times more than that. So in fact, you know, what we recommend is a tiny fraction of the Christmas tree of ideas that this process generates. And that is uh, respect, highly respected by Congress. It sort of, puts a lid on pork barrel and you know politics sort of driving uh, how the field moves forward. This is our community uh, speaking uh, for itself and uh, recommending the process through the committees, of course, that I showed. So, so much for the introduction. So how do you go about doing this, building a report like this? Uh, I'll come back to this graphic a couple times. I'm not gonna touch on it all right now. Um, it's a multi-step uh, process, but it begins, this has been likened to a, either a pyramid or a pathway, depending on your perspective, but it begins up here with science. Uh, as uh, the first slide uh, indicated, the first task of the decadal is to take stock of how far the subject has come over the last 10 years and where is it headed? What are the key questions that need to be answered over the next 10 to 20 years? How do, and how do we do it? And that, uh, this was a three-year process. Normally these surveys take two years because of COVID and the need to do most of it by Zoom. And you all know what it's like to have meetings over Zoom. It took an extra year nearly, but uh, uh, in the first eight months or so of the survey that we focused on essentially identifying the key science challenges. So let me move to, I'm gonna take a break from this uh, view graph. We'll come back to it later. As I said, I have to really touch on highlights. So you're gonna see a lot of single slides where, you know, for example, at Stewart Observatory, we have a lunch seminar this term on the decadal survey, and we've had entire hours devoted to the science 
questions in just one of the six panel areas. And I'm going to do in two minutes, essentially, all six of them. So pardon for that. Um, in many ways, uh, we were unlucky with COVID, uh, uh, and, but we were very lucky uh, in, in had doing our survey at an extraordinarily exciting time in astronomy. The last decade uh, was incredible in delivering results. Uh, you know, once a year, there's a Nobel Prize given in physics, so 10 of them over a decade. Over the last decade, six of those had something connection to astronomy. And that's extraordinary given that until not too long ago, astronomy wasn't even eligible. They didn't even consider it uh, eligible for a physics Nobel Prize. They had a different prize for it. And so, and that's, you know, the discovery of gravitational waves, work on black holes, cosmology, exoplanets, uh, so on. Uh, thousands of exoplanets discovered over the last decade. Uh, not only the discovery, detection of gravitational waves, but me new measurements of massive black holes that the models had not predicted. And of course, successful launches of many facilities. Uh, James Webb most recently, Gaia, and if you're familiar with the European astrometry satellite, large mission that is revolutionizing stellar astronomy as we speak. Um, so it was a chance, the survey could begin with a lot of boasting about, you know, everything, uh, how we had delivered essentially on the predictions of the survey before, but it sets a high bar for us. So the main activity obviously is to look forward. So uh, setting the priorities for the next 10 years, uh, of course, we got 573 great ideas from the community. Uh, we couldn't recommend all of those. And so we asked, there were six science panels. Uh, each of these white papers went to one or more panels. Every paper was read and digested. And we asked each panel, uh, distill all of that somehow into give us four questions, four key questions that can be answered, you think, over the next decade, and something called a discovery area, maybe something a little more high risk on the cutting edge a new technology or a new a science area or something where we could make a major leap. Uh, and for example, in 2010 survey, uh, one of the discovery areas was gravitational waves. And of course, you know, that turned out to be a very precious uh, prediction. Anyway, so we had these 30 questions and panel discovery areas, which were delivered to the main committee from these panels in early 2020. Um, and what we found was, even though there were 30 questions, things like understanding at last the nature of dark matter, what's dark matter, the amount of dark energy, you can imagine the usual suspects in terms of questions, uh, they all fit very nicely under three umbrella themes. And you know, to tell a story that we were told umpteen times, your survey book has to tell a story. So we built a story around these three themes very briefly. One of the first is worlds and suns in context, uh, building on the extraordinary progress and uh, observations and theory of exoplanets over the last decade. Every indication is uh, that's not gonna stop. The, the wave of discoveries is just gonna keep on uh, rolling through the next decade. And also stellar astronomy, uh, the understanding of stars, mainly from Gaia, uh, but also Kepler, Corot, uh, many new facilities are really revolutionizing our, our understanding of stellar astrophysics, advancing it in major ways and uh, bringing a rebirth of interest in that subject in the US. So that was one theme. New messengers and new physics is the combination of exploiting the new tools we have, for example, gravitational waves, uh, other particles like neutrinos, uh, and the time domain, I'll explain that in a second, um, and uh, exploring new physics, trying to understand what the dark sector is, dark energy, dark matter. Uh, there are going to be missions flown in the next decade, uh, Webb, uh, the uh, Roman uh, Observatory, and so on, which will really make major inroads here. And then the third is actually a subject I work in, cosmic ecosystems. That's basically the origin, the formation of stars and galaxies, 
and their evolution over the history of the universe and how they connect to each other and how they connect to the origin and evolution of the universe itself. Um, the, that's an old theme. Uh, it's showed up in previous surveys. The new twist is we realize you can't study how stars form and how galaxies form and how the universe form as separate problems. They all affect each other. Uh, explosion of a single supernova can transform a galaxy. Uh, and you know, the, 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 the seeds of galaxies, our cells, everything were planted in the first instance of the Big Bang. So exploring those connections is the third theme. Then uh, we added to that, to the themes, we wanted to define mainly for the public and for uh, trying to uh, advocate for a survey uh, in government, uh, three science goals that were very ambitious. We were told by the agencies be very ambitious, but things that we thought could capture their imagination, things we could really do over the next 20 years um, that they could that that someone who wasn't a PhD would understand are important. So pathways to habitable worlds, we've put down a marker. Uh, we've set as a goal to be able to make images of Earth-like planets around stars like the sun at the same separation, essentially make family portraits, take pictures of solar systems other than our own, some of the nearest solar systems, not indirect detection, actually image them and then put those, uh, the light from those little pale blue dots down the slit of a spectrograph and see what their atmospheric gases are made of and look for biomarkers. If you don't think that's ambitious, I don't know what is, but believe it or not, we think it's attainable in about over the next two decades. Um, new windows on the dynamic universe is the idea to exploit a whole new series of observatories. The Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, you may have heard about already, uh, used to be called LSST, uh, being built in Chile, should be commissioned in the next year or two. Uh, is a three degree field imaging telescope in the south. It will image the entire southern sky every few nights and essentially start making movies, but make a 10 year movie of skies. It essentially will detect tens of millions of variable, variable phenomena every night, everything from supernova explosions to variable stars, uh, possibly even some exoplanet driven phenomena and so on. Combining that with the power of gravitational waves, uh, X-ray satellites and so on to study uh, explosive uh, phenomena in the universe. And number three is, uh, unveil is uh, essentially reconstruct the history of how galaxies came into being uh, and the physics that drives it. Uh, that started uh, on Christmas with the launch of Webb. Uh, Webb is going to really complete the story of the observations of galaxy evolution. And then we think we need a further successor telescope beyond Hubble, the same one that will image the habitable worlds uh, to actually understand the physical drivers of that. So that's, I realize that's probably a five minute snapshot but it's the most I can do if I want to get uh, done in the next uh, 20 plus minutes. But uh, we're going to have a breakout for those who are interested after you can ask about all this stuff. So that's the, so anyway, those 24, 30 questions and discovery areas became yardsticks. And for the rest of the survey, then we assessed all of the project ideas that were given to us, program ideas. And as we decide and prioritize what should be built, the first thing we did is hold them up against the yardstick of these science questions. How many of the science questions were you near, your new telescope, your new you know, uh, computer facility, whatever it is, address? Uh, uh, and then we built a program. Uh, usually, it's been typical that the surveys emphasize on the biggest things. Uh, what are the biggest telescopes you're recommending? You know, the James, 10, 20 years ago, that was James Webb Space Telescope. 10 years ago, it's what's now the Roman Observatory, originally called W First, uh, et cetera. Um, um, uh, and that, we're, we're going to take you through that. But this survey, 
partly as part of our charge, in fact, decided we had to give more attention than has been given in the past to all of the what you can call the infrastructure of astronomy, the smaller projects, the smaller satellites, the smaller telescopes, and uh, things like support for theoretical astrophysics, support for computing, data science, and support for the people. For the first time, we had a committee dedicated to looking at the human dimension of what we do and the career things like career paths, uh, obviously equity, diversity, public outreach, those benefits to the nation and those sorts of things. Uh, and our guiding principle, one of them was balance, that you have to forge a balance between, you can't, you can build, you know, just Hubble Space Telescopes, but if there isn't money, you know, to bring students in to, 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 to reduce those data and train the next generation astrophysicist, you know, it's gonna be short-term gain. So the uh, survey took a holistic view, and I'm going to start in describing those very briefly, talk about those two foundation elements, one slide at a time, uh, one slide each, and then I'll talk about uh, the major items and, you know, most of the time that's left. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we had a, a, a survey for the a committee for the first time, a panel uh, to make recommendations to our main committee, and then we digested those and distilled those into a chapter of the report on uh, the profession itself and its societal impacts. I love this quote. It comes from that chapter, from that committee. The pursuit of science and scientific excellence is inseparable from the humans who uh, animate it. This was the youngest panel we've ever put. We deliberately loaded it up with people in early career, including our own Vertina Bezla, uh, who you may know, associate professor at Steward, uh, and knowing full well that, you know, these are people one or two generations younger than me, knowing they would, you know, recommend things that I, I an older person like me might not, you know, think about or not necessarily agree with. They delivered uh, with a very bold set of recommendations, most of which we hope we have carried forward in our report. Again, in the interest of time, I can't do justice uh, uh, to, I could spend a whole talk on this. You could always invite your Tina if you want to do that. Uh, but the kinds of recommendations we made uh, to the agencies, first of all, we found uh, there is a lot of evidence to suggest, despite the best efforts and best intentions of all, that are still biases in the things in things like who gets telescope time, that young people, you know, the, the same proposal written by a young person, literally the same proposal, and one by a big name people have heard of, the young person often gets lower scores. We know that now because Hubble Space Telescope and several other uh, uh, facilities have now uh, have systems where they evaluate proposals with the names rubbed out anonymous peer review. And since they started doing it, the age range of the people who are getting the time has broadened, right? And uh, it's become more gender neutral, yada, yada. So, uh, but unfortunately, a lot of the agencies, especially National Science Foundation, just doesn't have the data to allow us to look at this and make and monitor it and ch check over time whether they're doing better. So we recommend all three agencies get to bet, uh, together. This is complicated. It's it's not entirely their fault. This has to do with data privacy laws and things. But in fact, they've embraced this recommendation and are working on it. Um, diversity over the last decade, uh, representation of women has improved uh, quite substantially, especially among students in junior uh, ranks, not among leaders, you know, uh, people at the top, that needs to be fixed. And so we have recommendations on how the agencies can nurture, essentially set up apprenticeships and so on uh, to develop talent uh, with a broader range of people, not just those at Caltech, you know, in Harvard and Arizona and so on, et cetera. Um, and uh, even use that as, a, as an assessment criterion. You know, if you have a project for a satellite and it's 40 men and no women, well, you should get dinged for that, right? 
things like that. Um, and uh, our big failure in our subject is, although representation of women, uh, Hispanic Americans is another area where there's been a big uh, improvement among African Americans, no improvement whatsoever over the decade um, and very low. We're talking one to 2% uh, representation of a group that's what, you know, 10% or more of the population of the country. Uh, several pro we recommend areas. This partly is, has to do with physics education and the physics society is already working with our American Astronomical Society to uh, uh, improve things in the classroom. But there are programs, for example, where agencies can fund students, for example, uh, many African American students, of course, get their degrees at historically uh, black colleges, almost none of them have astronomy departments, they have physics departments, but they maybe have one astronomer, they just don't have the exposure to research as an undergraduate that would even let them know that graduate school is a possibility, much less make them competitive. And you can set up bridge programs to bring students like that for, say, summer internships to Arizona or other places. Uh, they've been done in the past. They're incredibly successful. Funding's often been cut off when budgets were tight, and now they need to come back. And already, within a week of the proposals, uh, the report's release, uh, this program had been reinstated by the NSF and so on. Uh, other... Uh, Formal recognition of harassment and discrimination as forms of professional misconduct. Uh, there is a section on how to do a better job of maintaining relations with the communities who host our mountaintops and our telescopes. Something Kit Peak, for example, in OAO, has done a very good job with, right, with a uh, Tenhoto Odom, but we know of examples where that hasn't gone as well. And uh, quite a bit of uh, attention given to the satellite constellations preserving dark skies and the radio frequency spectrum, which is also being threatened by 5G and, uh, and satellites. So that's, it. I'm afraid, a wonderful section of the report summarized again in a couple minutes. Um, I'm going to even be quicker here. The, we had another committee for the first time look at all the little things that are done in science that are vital but aren't the big ticket telescopes. And so uh, among the re recommendations, just bang, 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 uh, the number of astronomers has doubled over the uh, last 20 years, professional astronomers, but the funding for the grant program to support them and their students has not increased proportionally or in proportion to the funding for the telescopes. So we're having examples like the Daniel Inouye Solar Telescope coming online Rubin telescope producing are going to produce scads of data, but you know not enough money to analyze them. So we want to see a rebalancing there. Uh, more attention to uh, investing in making our prof uh, our profession more data literate. Our students are doing a good job of that, but uh, we're going to do a lot more of machine learning and so on. Investments there and in the computers, obviously, laboratory astrophysics theory and technology development. These are the seeds of future decadal surveys. And I'm sorry, I'll, you understand why I'm uh, breezing through because I just looked at my watch. So let's now go on and talk about those facilities. I'll first talk about space and then, uh, and then uh, the ground. And again, um, again, very brief touching on, this is a 600 page report, mostly pan, a 200 page main report. But you know, I'm trying to summarize that in sort of 40 minutes. Um, so how do we, so it was very interesting, gratifyingly to us at the beginning of our survey, we begin our survey by going to Washington DC and getting presentations over three days from the federal agencies and from congressional staff and so on. They sort of set us, you know, it's those kickoff meeting. And all three agencies, uh, the Air Force joined later, uh, encouraged us to be ambitious, be bold. Don't be afraid of asking for too much. And to quote one of the NASA people who talked to us, administrators said, if you ask for very little, we'll give you exactly what you asked for. 
or less, you know. So be ambitious. And we've done that. And the feedback we've gotten from Congress and the agencies so far, at least most of them, is uh, they're happy with that. And the, But to do that, you have to balance ambition with realism. Uh, we live in tremendous uncertainty right now, right? COVID uncertainty, got big uh, budget deficits heading our way, a fractured Congress. Uh, when we wrote the report, we didn't know if James Webb's launch would be successful. That was a huge uncertainty. So we proposed, you know, if possible, do all, everything, but with off ramps, decision rules, priorities, and say, look, if the funding is less optimistic than you predicted, then don't do this, you know, go in this direction. But so giving them some broad guardrails, but also leaving the agencies with flexibility to make decisions on the fly. Uh, just so you know, uh, ambition is unbounded. They give us budget guidelines. They give us charts like this where they say, you know, over the next 10 years, you have a pessimistic scenario, which is usually inflation only. Uh, and then usually optimistic is like doubling over the decade, which is like 7% growth each year over a decade. And we have to, we're not allowed to recommend more than the most optim, you know, the top line is. And so truth will be somewhere in between. Uh, uh, that's what we mean by ambitious tempered by realism. Um, so let's start uh, with space. Um, and uh, uh, well, we'll start with space in the ground. Uh, one recommendation, I'm going to almost skip this slide is before you build anything new, make sure you finish the things we recommended last time, right? Uh, so James Webb, we can tick that off the list now. It's safely, we hope, launched. But uh, the, the NOAA Solar Telescope recommended last, it was just uh, commissioned a few, uh, six months ago, is returning data in Hawaii. The Rubin Observatory, the Time Domain Telescope, will start in a couple of years. Then in the mid-decade, uh, Roman telescope is a, a Hubble aperture telescope with, but with a field, uh, a field uh, like the area, I think almost 100 times bigger in terms of area, almost, you know, image the whole full moon and more. Um, and then we are part of two European led missions, an X ray observatory, Athena, and a gravitational wave mission, LISA. Those were recommended 10 years ago. We re endorsed them and argue, please finish these. And now we talk about what's new. Um, let me uh, skip through this. So I'm gonna talk about our space priorities. First, what are our big ticket item recommendations? And then uh, and how did we, you know, what are the, the gist of our recommendations were? And then briefly talk about the ground in the same way. Usually, Every decade will recommends one new super ambitious project like Hubble or like James Webb or like 10 years ago, the Roman Observatory, a multi billion dollar observatory. Uh, and this time, NASA paved the way by commissioning four teams of astronomers uh, to deliver, uh, starting between 2017 and 2020 four concepts for possible flagship called back then missions, multi-billion dollar telescopes. Two of them, Habex and Louvoir, were um, uh, essentially Hubbles. Uh, they would have st uh, study, uh, image the sky in the UV and optical, uh, but ranging in aperture between three and a half and 15 meters. They would do everything that Hubble would do pretty much, except you know, 10 to 100 times faster. And each one would have a device that would allow you to detect an Earth next to a sun 10,000 times brighter by eclipsing the light of the star somehow. Louvoir would do it with a coronagraph, in other words, uh, optics in the camera itself that would block the starlight. Habex would have a uh, football field size star shade flying 80,000 miles in front of the telescope uh, to do the eclipsing, plus probably a chronograph. Lynx was an X-ray satellite, multi-billion dollar X-ray satellite 
origins a multi-billion dollar infrared satellite. So the, the thinking before the survey started, and we sort of thought ourselves was, we were tasked to pick one. Normally the surveys rank them one, two, three, four, but only the first one gets done. It start, work on it starts immediately and the others never happen, right? Um, so we looked at these four and we immediately, uh, we ran into problems. The first thing we realized was there's a good case for all of these. And in fact, the added benefit of being able to observe the sky in infrared, optical, UV, and uh, X-rays together is far more than the sum of the parts. So in a perfect world, you'd try to do, the, uh, you, you would do one of these to say, and then both of these. Um, so, you know, in dream world, fantasy world, you would like to do that. And it isn't entirely a fantasy. This happened once before with what were called the great observatories. Between 1990 and 2003, NASA uh, launched four observatories. That they were only named the great observatories later. Um, one in gamma rays, one in X-rays, one in infrared, and then Hubble, uh, which between them essentially did that. They, and they were operating simultaneously. And there was been incredible syn symmetry, uh, synergies uh, between them. Of course, Chandra and Hubble still operating today. Um, and only one of them really cost, you know, Hubble, if you inflate to today, the original mission would be about $9 billion inflated to today's dollars. Um, the others were in the one to $3 billion category. So it's not outrageous to think maybe you could do it again, but no, it just doesn't work, didn't work. Um, for a couple of reasons. One is, uh, although most of these missions were told, deliver us a concept that will only cost $5 billion. They thought they could convince Congress maybe to build a $5 billion, you know, something half of web uh, after the web experience. When they were cost, this was, uh, this is the survey itself undertook an industrial contractor costing. They all, cost two to three and a half times more than that $5 billion cap. This actually had a higher cap, but it broke that anyway. And this is for the smallest blue bar. Um, and the estimated time to finish them was 20 years each. So if you tried to do this again, say first do one of these and then do one of these and then do the other, first of all, you need 40 billion even if there are no cost overruns, right? And if you build them sequentially, it's 20, what is it? It's 20, 40, 2082 before the last one's done. Now, I don't know about you, I will be retired in 20, I will be retired in the literal sense. Uh, and unless there are some uh, elementary school children in the audience for this talk or teenagers, you will probably be retired as well. It just doesn't work and we can't afford it. Add to that, that web overran by a factor of 10. It was, when it was recommended, we recommended as a $1 billion mission, it ended up costing 10. So uh, in the end, got to speed up, don't worry. Uh, the, uh, our recommendation in the end was we can't, we decided the system is broken. We can't do things in the old way. So what we said was, for now, we're not going to recommend any of these uh, those uh, four missions. Instead, we want to add an additional step between decadal survey and then congressional approval of to agreement to build one. We want to add a new step. The decadal will recommend missions to go to a next stage of planning, what we call maturation. and. Uh, they will take a few years, invest a few hundred million dollars in making sure this thing will cost, fit under the cap, solve the engineering problems, the technology problems, get it ready. Um, and then if it passes all the tests, hold a, a review or another decadal survey and recommend it then to go forward. The good news is you can do more, instead of doing that, 
20 years apart for each, you could in principle do this for multiple missions. You could have the intermediate step for all three of those concepts. And that's pretty much what we recommended. Our top priority was a successor, a UV optical telescope, roughly of six meter aperture, something between Louvoir and Habex, no more than $11 billion um, ever, no overruns, that's it, uh, except inflation, obviously. Um, but uh, study it first, and if you if the if the team can convince NASA it can be built for that cost, then review it in a few maybe six years, and then before the next decade, I'll approve it to go ahead. In the meantime, later in the decade, while that's happening, start one of these for links and the UV uh, X-ray and infrared. Don't build a ten billion dollar telescope. Build something a third of the size, three to five billion. Meet that, in other words, you know, meet the five billion dollar target. Um, it'll have to wait its turn before you know. This would have to be finished probably before you really start heavy building on this. Um, but uh, you you begin to speed up the pace. We have to wait twenty years for this one, but then you can do them at a five or ten year cadence. They're much smaller. They're much more affordable, and if this one fails for, for some reason, number one in line, you know, uh, can't make it. It doesn't become too big to fail. You move one of these above. You flip it, right? You don't maybe don't cancel this. You delay it. So anyway, the reason for the ordering is the incredible science of imaging exoplanets plus the general science for the ecosystems theme in particular. All the three themes that a Hubble that's got detectors 10 to 100 times more sensitive uh, will bring you. I'm going to skip that. Uh, also for space, we have a, on smaller scale, a time domain, a recommended series of very small satellites to uh, uh, replace aging facilities like SWIFT to follow uh, things like supernovae and gravitational wave events in time, and a line of $1 billion probe missions uh, to replace the gap between the flagships and uh, explorers. Finally, obviously I obviously have to talk about the ground. So yes, I guess I'm gonna break my 45, but I'll be done in five for sure, um, folks. Um, let me just uh, go through our recommendations. So our ground, uh, we had uh, several projects report uh, recommended to us. And I'm just going to summarize them to you in the order they were recommended. Our top recommendation is that uh, the NSF, uh, as you all know, probably Arizona is part of a consortium to build a 24 meter uh, telescope, a sort of uh, upgraded uh, MMT uh, in Chile, the Giant Magellan Telescope. And there's another consortium building a 30 meter segmented telescope, either to go in Hawaii or the Canary Islands. Um, both projects are well, are very mature, very well along, but there's room. They haven't signed up, raised all the funding or have all of their partners. And our uh, recommendation is that the uh, NSF uh, buy a one quarter share in each of those two telescopes invest uh, in both the construction and then the operations of those. We know at least 20% is available. We're, we suggest they try to uh, uh, get a little more. Uh, it's not sure that both telescopes will happen. Of course, there are issues with the 30 meter telescope with Mauna Kea and Hawaii. Uh, both projects have somewhat of a cash shortfall other than what the NSF money would bring. Uh, and for, for one reason or another, only one were viable, uh, then we would say buy as much of the time on the one you can uh, to maximize the time to the community. And obviously, if the NSF can't get Congress to authorize the entire full money, they would have to pick one over the other. But we hope there are lots of advantages to having both. Um, the uh, second ranked uh, there are two ra other radio facilities that are our number two and three rank. Cosmic microwave CMBS-4 is a cosmic background, microwave background experiment, millimeter dishes at the South Pole. 
and at very high altitudes in the Altiplano of Chile, uh, to me it's two things. It's an experiment designed to measure the fireball radiation from the Big Bang, uh, you know, thing that's already resulted in two or three Nobel Prizes. Um, this is to look for what are called CMB signatures and the polarization. These are features in the polarized signal from the microwave background that were imprinted during the epoch of inflation at the very early instance of the Big Bang. Inflation is the bedrock foundation of modern cosmology, but there's scant observational proof of it. Um, these B modes, if they're detected, would be that proof, uh, almost a sure Nobel Prize if they get it. You may recall there was an experiment called BICEP about seven years ago that claimed to find them that turned out to be a false alarm. Uh, this project can do it. Or if they don't see them, that's the end of inflation. Uh, that's back to the drawing board for all of cosmology. So either way, huge. Also, the same maps will be, they, they will map the entire, much of the southern sky, not all of it, much of it, and it will have the same impact for radio astronomy that Rubin Telescope will have in optical. So uh, very important. Uh, built by the Department of Energy by and large, but with a big contribution from the NSF. It's about a six or $700 million facility. Finally, uh, an upgrade to the VLA from the uh, 22 mile array it is now to one that would have dishes extending over most of North America um, uh, with many more dishes and modern technology. Uh, it will do for radio astronomy over the VLA what the ELTs will do for optical and near infrared astronomy, order of magnitude gains in resolution and sensitivity. Uh, here's a bullet list of the things that'll kind of do. The trouble with the, the challenge of NGVLA is very expensive, over $3 billion as presented to the survey and costed for us, um, and over $100 million to operate, about nearly 10 times how much it costs to operate the VLA, which it would replace. Um, so here, we, would, we recommend it happen, but in two steps, like those space missions, it, you need a two-step process. First, a maturation study where they build one, the first antenna, they learn how to build an antenna, solve those problems, and now they'll know what it really costs, so you can sharpen that number, and do some studies of the science, see if there are other options that might, you know, lower cost options, spread over time options. And then again, as with the space missions late in the decade, review the results of all that work. And if the ELTs are well along the way, CMBS4, then start immediately on building NGVLA, uh, but otherwise wait. And finally, uh, say there are two projects, this is 10 seconds, uh, that are physics projects, not astronomy, but we were asked, they, they do astronomy. One would be advanced gravitational wave facilities in the ground and a incredible observatory you can ask about in the chat, Ice Cube 2, that actually detects high energy neutrinos going through the earth and being detected by under the ice of Antarctica. Uh, we, have, we have endorsed those for the astronomy they do, but since it's physics committees that have to decide, you know, rank them, we can't. Uh, do that. And that's where I'll stop uh, with the, uh, the that's it. So uh, I will say report received very, we've actually been amazed by the reception we've gotten from uh, our own community is probably our toughest audience, you know, professional astronomers. Uh, we testified before Congress in December. Uh, at the end of the hearing, the chair uh, 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 said it was his favorite hearing in the decade, the eight years he has chaired this committee. Uh, the agencies are very enthusiastic. Of course, they have to find the money. That's all a big if, but so far so good. And uh, so uh, we're very happy with the way it turned out. And uh, for Fiona and me, it's 10 years of lobbying now to try to make it happen. So stop there and apology, sincere apologies. I know I, I, I went uh, way over and should not have. 
Oh, that's okay, Rob. We, we really appreciate all the information you've given us. Um, we have a question, let me see, for from, I think it's James. Yes, a question from James. Is there any support for replacing Arecibo? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Arecibo, the uh, disaster, you know, of course, the collapse of the dish uh, happened after all of the fact finding phase of our survey. We were in the final stages of putting the report together. So there was absolutely no way uh, if we had convened a, a new panel to answer that question, uh, as of course the agencies are now doing and Congress is doing independently, it would have delayed the report yet another six to 12 months. So uh, what we did was, it turns out that the panel, the radio panel had assessed how important it was to keep Arecibo going before the collapse. So you have an absolutely honest unpolitical statement. So we published that uh, describes, then we looked at that science. Um, we, our recommendation is that radio astronomy on port in Puerto Rico should continue, but we think uh, one option obviously would be to replace, make another big 300 meter dish or something even bigger. We think there are other possibilities in particular making part of the NGVLA there. And we think there are ways of doing most of the science. Uh, so don't necessarily make a you know, copycat of what collapsed, but uh, yeah, let's continue radio astronomy in Arecibo, but please radio community consider a fairly a wide range of possibilities, concepts for uh, what might replace it. Okay, thank you. We have a question from David. We'll be on the moon in the next 20 years. Why no plans for an observatory on the far side of the moon? Yeah, the uh, we received white papers uh, by that. Um, and in fact, we are reminded that by this question has been asked of us by the people who wrote those white papers. I don't know if David is one of them, I don't think so. The, um, it's a particular, in fact, there was a probe study uh, done, uh, a probe scale study uh, called for a concept called far side, a radio uh, telescopes on the dark side where you get no uh, interference at all. Uh, our panel, we had panels uh, look at that. Um, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, we decided it wasn't uh, a priority at the level of the other things we talked about. And part of the academy process, the rules are we don't go around, we don't spend a lot of time explaining why we didn't recommend something. Uh, it's, you know, it's kicking, you know, it's kicking people while they're down. And uh, like, remember what I said, we've recommended about seven or eight large projects on the ground and in space out of 50 to 80 ideas, right? And that, that was one of them. So I know you won't be entirely satisfied by that. But that's most I can say publicly. Thank you. Yeah, I, I realize there's lots of competitive kinds of considerations and, and things to think about in this. Yeah, I should um, say I can, I, uh, I have rules. I can tell you what's in the report but questions like how, why did you decide this or what was the vote? <laughs> you know, obviously, you know, we we're never, we're not allowed uh, to okay. keep that to ourselves. Okay, a question from Bill. Can you speak about the public engagement recommendations? Yeah, yeah, very much. Um, uh, there were several dimensions to that. If you read that section of the report, uh, a big part of what we want to do uh, do was emphasize how big that impact is. That you know the question comes up all the time on the hill and elsewhere. Your your missions are expensive. You're you know we're spending all these millions and billions. Why for astronomy? And one of the big reasons is of course the outreach that many of you do right when you have a star party. What we do as professionals. Um, and we have that, you know, we have the, what, you know, 
the, the, when the Event Horizon Telescope images that Ferial and Demetrius and others released a couple of years ago, the hundreds of millions of web hits, you know, uh, breaking all records, you know, and so on. So we documented all of that. Um, in terms of uh, recommendations, uh, it was mainly the agencies do have program. There is federal support for that. And it was an area, so we, we basically recommended, please keep up uh, that good uh, work. And also uh, when individual scientists, when people like me apply for grants, whether it's NASA and NSOF, we have to document something called broad impacts. Apart from what you're gonna do as an astronomer in your office, how are you gonna help engage the public or what are you doing that will influence science more broadly uh, we really gave a very strong endorsement, both in the uh, uh, both in the state profession report and our report. Keep keep that requirement, and if anything, uh, uh, you know, really evaluate it, uh, put teeth into it, uh, because uh, you know, ten, five percent of your effort in, in outreach or working with school children, you know, some of the bridge programs, so on, all this stuff we've talked about has huge impact. Whether most of those kids won't become astronomers, uh, but as you all know, we have a shortage of trained uh, STEM professionals and engineers and doctors and so on in this country. And uh, a lot of them, you know, that spark is set by astronomy. I, I hope that that's part of an answer. Nate. Thank you. Um, Ed asked, um, there has been an ongoing concern for ground-based follow-up facilities to support telescopes like Rubin. How does the committee address this? Yeah, uh, we took that bull by the horns. Um, first of all, you that one slide that I probably garbled when I rushed showing you all the facilities coming in the decade, we emphasized, especially for the NSF, uh, you know, now that Rubin is coming in line, you have to have the money there to deal with the data that Rubin is producing and the an OA telescope are producing, plus the existing ones, you know, Kit Peak, Gemini, uh, all of the others. Um, and uh, we had a record, I did decided I would, I ran out of time, I would never have time for it. We have uh, what's called a decision rule. We make a recommendation that says uh, from the ground, before the National Science Foundation builds the next big telescope, whether, and I hate to say it, whether it's GMT would be the next one or uh, TMT invests, you have to increase your investment in what you've asked about. The, 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 the problem is it isn't actually the money that builds these telescopes comes from a different pot of money than the money that supports astronomy year by year but it's the cost of running those telescopes. You know, NSF adds new telescopes at a higher rate than they close old ones. And every year, the, the cost of just running all of the observatories we have on the ground now is uh, approaching 80% of their whole budget. And it's squeezing out everything else. And we've said that has, you need a plan to fix that problem. And if it means, and I, I, I know Buell will probably shoot me, if it means, <laughs> you know, not investing uh, in some, you know, other things first, uh, it takes priority. Uh, that's the, the view of the committee, right? We mean it. Um, Heidi has a question. Are there any of the projects in the works at risk due to conflicts between nations, NATO, China, Russia? Yeah. Uh, I know of no projects uh, that we talked about that have Russian participation. There is a satellite called Rosat uh, flying, a German-Russian uh, collaboration. Uh, colleagues of mine in Garching actually are the, run, the German Institute that is running it. I haven't heard from them, but that, that is a possibility. That's an operating one. Uh, China is currently a partner in the 30 meter telescope. I have heard anecdotally, but won't repeat uh, which pro they have been approached by one or two of the, you know, the hypothetical projects moving forward. Um, 
And we learned from our congressional hearing how strongly some members of Congress feel about China being involved. So uh, this is a matter uh, we, uh, as part of the basic ground rules, a uh, decadal survey doesn't preach to Congress uh, about what, you know, whether they should boycott Russia or Ukraine or, well, they would never boycott Ukraine or China. It's their business. All I'll say is, yeah, I think it is a concern of theirs and it's a matter they have to deal with. It, uh, they don't take advice from us necessarily on that. We, we do have another question, but before that, I wanted to mention to members that um, there is a link in the chat uh, to read the full survey report. If you have an interest in that, you might want to access that link and copy it. And then we have a question from Heidi. Is there a coordinated effort to regulate satellites like Starlink? Yeah. Um... So uh, let me uh, start with the radio. Uh, there's a long established international uh, effort, uh, uh, international coordination in uh, protecting the radio frequency uh, space. Uh, the NSF is responsible for it in the US. It's a committee called CORF, C-O-R-F. And they uh, work very closely with NRAO but internationally with the other radio observatories and governments, they have lots of inter, so a lot of, and they coordinate with the, and the NSF coordinates with the FCC and so on. So I think on the radio side, that infrastructure exists. It really hasn't exist. The satellite constellations are of course, such a new development that that infrastructure has to sort of be established. Um, we realized, it was such a rapidly moving subject target that the decadal survey wasn't going to solve it by itself. But instead, we use the bully pulpit of the, you know, the tension of Congress. We make very strong statements that this problem, although now it isn't catastrophic for astronomy right now, you know, 10 years it could be, that it that we need to have a similar uh, mechanisms for creating that coordination. So we essentially have recommendations that ask uh, NSF, and if they want, you know, they might want to work with NASA, obviously, and whatever other agencies to please pick up that mantle. And uh, if you've been watching, you know, the emails and so on, I think that already was in the works before our survey was published. But uh, so we've added our stamp of approval. But I think it's something you want to keep an eye on. Uh, it's obviously very complex. And the one thing I'll say is it doesn't help. You can, Elon Musk and, and, and uh, uh, SpaceX have been very, you know, they talk to everybody. They've been fairly cooperative. They're trying things. But, you know, if some company in some other country, you know, there, there are at least 10 countries launching these things, uh, only takes one, right, to ruin it for everybody. So it's got to be international. Right. Um, I don't have any other questions. Jim or Terry, is there anything I've missed that you, you're you seeing that's a question or a comment? Nothing on Facebook. Okay. All looks good on this end. Okay. Wonderful. So, um, so Rob, um, we will give you a break now. And for our members later that are going to be involved in uh, in chat rooms, Rob is going to be available for our discussion with you um, later. And um, so we will, at this point in time, um, express our appreciation to the Facebook people for coming. Um, we're so delighted to have you with us. We hope that you will look at our website and that you will, you know, enjoy some of the educational things and interesting information on our website and that you will link with us on um, other things that are been listed in our Facebook history and other recordings that we have. Um, we would love for you to to continue to be involved with the club. And we hope to see you at, um, at our member meeting on the first Friday in April. So please join us in and thank you for joining us tonight.
We also want to point out that on April 9th, we will be at Brandy Fenton Memorial Park yes. for the Astronomy Festival. And the information is on that screen there. Yes. And that's a really special event. And I'll highlight the fact that um, we will be giving away a telescope to someone who, ten, who uh, attends. And so, um, and we will be helping people use their personal telescopes. Many times people get a telescope and have lots of questions. And we will be glad to help with that. So thank you so much for joining us and we hope to see you soon.